great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this conference today. This is the first conference after uh, Corona time. Even it's still small, it is a, a real meeting, as we say now, not a virtual meeting. And uh, it's our pleasure that the Con the contact, the content relates to the Horn of Africa and the Horn of Africa Peace Initiative, which we see here. And uh, we heard uh, different aspects of Horn of Africa, especially we were inspired when now two years ago this peace process started between uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea and somehow we started this peace initiative 10 years before, thanks to Mr. Hamdan Abdul Qadir and all his friends who worked for uh, this vision that there can be peace in the Horn of Africa. And uh, of course, the maybe biggest country in the Horn is Ethiopia. It's uh, a landlocked country now, which is very uh, strange. When you look at the map, I, I, I printed the map because it looks like it's so huge, but it has no access to the sea. Mm -hmm. So this is why this relationship with Eritrea is so important. And it's our great uh, honor that today we have a special guest a native of Ethiopia from the part uh, of the Somali people in Ethiopia, I understand. Professor Mohammed Hassan, who is based somewhere in Belgium, near Brussels, I heard. And he will give us some insight into all this development. We heard the president of Ethiopia got the Nobel Prize, but even you are, if you have a Nobel Prize, doesn't mean for peace that it's so easy to govern your country in a way that it remains peaceful. Yeah, so this is a big push. The world looks, looks at Ethiopia with some hope. I hope we will not be disappointed, yeah, because sometimes we were disappointed about ourselves, but we believe in Ethiopia. So. Uh, I want to hand over to Professor uh, Mohammed Hassan. Maybe uh, it's okay. Okay. We, all the people of Horn of Africa, we want peace. A peace. which comes from down up, is not only peace between the states, also peace which changes the old relationship and build a new relationship on new basis. I will not go very in details how these countries have been created. It's not because of the wish of the people lived there. It's because of the wish of capital and forces of European powers. The whole had for 60 years war, war between Somalia and Ethiopia, the conflict in Kenya, war between Eritrea and Ethiopia, first independence war, and then 20 years ago, the war which been ignited by the minority regime in Ethiopia against Eritrea. 
And this war are sponsor, sponsored war. It is not the, the nature of the ruling classes in these countries are dependent, non-patriotic, to a certain extent, agent of external forces. Modern managers of prisons. They didn't have the vision to bring independent vision of their own to bring peace. Three Ethiopian regimes from Haile Selassie until two years ago, they came from a minority who doesn't represent the majority of Ethiopian people. One, a minority feudal calls himself an emperor and supported by United States. Ethiopia from 1950 until the collapse of the emperor with the popular revolt had the chance and had the highest assistant of United States in the African continent. Ethiopia in 1960-59, my country Ethiopia, it had 44,000 modern army, while most of African countries, including Egypt and Tunisia, they didn't have even a police. It had a military academy built by the United States. It had a naval force. While African countries, when they got independent, they have to start from scratch. But Ethiopia was a feudal state led by an emperor. And the slogan and the constitution of that country, you can't farm on the sky and you cannot accuse the emperor. That is the constitution. U.S. interest forced a country created by Italian colonialism, as all African countries are product of forces of French or English colonial powers, Italy created a colony called Eritrea. Despite of the domination of Italian colonialism and later on Italian fascism, Eritrea had a better infrastructure relatively than Ethiopia. They forced Eritrea and Ethiopia, a feudal emperor, to make a federation between those two countries. I call it a marriage between a cat and elephant. This kind of marriage will not survive very easily. You could see it. But they didn't care. Their national interest to control the Red Sea, to fight the Soviet Union, that was the higher agenda. Eritrea, high mountain. There was no satellite at that moment. They cannot hear what the Soviet Union is doing. Middle East was very important for them. They say, what was this Eritrea? Two brothers in the 60s became the most important policymaker in the United States. John Forster Dallas, which was head of foreign office, and his brother, who created the CIA, Alan Dallas. They decided the fate of Eritrea. And we suffered 30 years war, which was unnecessary. We could have agreed if we were left alone and what kind of formula we will agree among ourselves. But it was not our determination. It's an external force 
stronger, imposes it as well, and it created a war. That war ended in 1991. With a lot of sacrifice of Eritrean people, later on the Soviet Union came also there, they defeated the Eritreans, defeated, Soviet-backed regime in Addis Ababa. A new government came, and that government led by, a, later on, which I left them, I was a member of that, the TPLF, the Tigray People Liberation Front. Our idea at that moment was, we are going to start a new relationship in the Horn of Africa. A relationship based on a new ground. We can have common economic policy. We can have, we can really stop the civil war in Somalia. The population in the Horn of Africa, when you look, they are the same. Linguistically are intermixed when you take me. My counterparts, people who speak my language, they live in Kenya. We Somalis, we live in Somalia. We live in a big part of Ethiopia, which now is, we are speaking. Djibouti, partly Somali speaking. We thought that we will build a new relationship in the region. There are nationalities who are cross-border, who live in Sudan. There are nationalities cross-border in Eritrea. The Afars, the Bani Amrs, the Bija, they live in Sudan, and they live also in it. These nationalities could be also another bridge to build a new peace, a new economic relation. But somebody was not happy on that. They fund, supported, a greedy minority, narrow forces who are ruling Ethiopia. They ignited a war with Eritrea, and then they touched their back, and they told them when the Somali is trying to reconcile and rebuild Somalia again, they tell them, go, go, stop this. And they invaded Somalia, and of course they were defeated and left, but killed a lot of Somalis and created antagonism among the people. Peace, it is our motto. We want peace. Because 60 years we suffered. And for us, the most important community is peace. Once we have peace, people will work. And we have a very big resources to give you in the resources. <coughs> Ethiopia, as a country, have the largest stock of livestock in Africa. 120 million livestock. Goat, sheep, dr dromedary camels, name it. Second, Ethiopia is the water tower of Africa. Media shows you Ethiopians are dying and there is famine. Ethiopia have more than 20 huge rivers, bigger than the Danube. Is it normal that you having all this and then you, you become poor and you beg European Union food? Constantly 20 million Ethiopians are in danger and must get food from outside? <coughs> now, two years since the change. <coughs> A young prime minister coming from a modest family not born in a big city, a so-called cosmopolitan city. He became a prime minister of Ethiopia. And he understood cleverly and brave of him. He says, I will march 
and I will go to Eritrea and I will make peace with Eritrea. Chapeau. Because the forces who wants constant conflict, they were not happy. It's not the troops on the ground who are making the problem, the one who subsidized them in the back. Clever, have money, they knew the intrigue of politics, capacity of penetration, they want constant war to control the region. With their false journalists, I call them, they are not journalists, they are charlatans, paid mercenaries at our expense. The region I came from, 60 years, produces only refugees. Sixth generation passed by refugees and war. Peace for us means life. Once we have peace, we can mobilize our population. We are not genetically antagonistic among ourselves. And we are not disabled Mongols, we can think. Two years we have peace, but there are elements who are not happy. When there is peace, those of a business of war, they will close their shops. Those who are connected with the business of war and putting the drum, the so-called journalist, they will lose because they cannot write about peace and fraternity among us. We, the, whole, the people of Horn of Africa, we need peace before everything. Nobody produces us in their factory. We have a very long history, a very strong culture and values. NGOs, charlatans armed by the public money, come in to us and promote war. Certain new powers, regional powers, they want to expand. One of it is Turkey. Tamadud, new Ottoman policy. I'm sorry, I'm a Somali and I say kata kat. We don't, we don't understand intrigues. We say a kata. They came with different flags, with different Bibles, with different Qurans. We say, stop that, sell it in your market. Our market is exhausted. We have suffered from your intrigues and we want peace. And one of the understanding of the Horn of Africa television to promote peace and to bring people around the table. People, they don't know each other. Ethiopia is 80 nationalities. The smallest one, probably it could be several thousand. The biggest ones, it could be the bigger one is the Oromo, 40 million. The Amhara, 30 million. The Somalis, 8 million and a half. And I say to them, and I say to the young people, 
we have lost trillion hours by looking at each other as if we are enemies. We were born there and we are going to stay there and we will remain there. There is no geographical change. To conclude, the second chapter, which the media here in the, in the West never spoke about. Now there is also certain ruling classes. They like to put drum for conflict between Egypt and Ethiopia because of this dam, the Nile dams. Journalists write. Some divided to Egyptian side, like football team, Arsenal, and, 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 and one of the team. I believe one of the major points that nobody spoke about in the last 40 years, a serious economic transformation happened from our region to the Western banks. Literally, we were looted. You are very nice people. You are from Austria, from everywhere. I have to be very honest with you. Otherwise, it is hypocrite. My coming here has no meaning. And I don't want to lie. Only when you take 30 years Mubarak's regime, he was stealing from the Egyptians, people. Every year, $2 billion. When he fall down, when he's in the process of falling down, the CIA released the report that the man have $72 billion in the Western banks. $72 billion of one man. Tunisia. Somebody, ordinary police, trained in the police academy in the United States, worked with them, they appointed him in Poland as an ambassador, and spy. They put him in, in power. Looted Libya, uh, Tunisia. He lives now in Saudi Arabia. Nobody speaks about that. What happened to that wealth? Where is it? The Sudanese, Regime, the Islamist regime in Sudan, who came in 1989. Sudan, at one time, it was 10% of the British GDP coming from Sudan, from the cotton plantation. 10% of the GDP of Britain. Today is a devastated country. Bashir and his friends, the Islamists, stole 70 billion dollars. Did you hear that? Oh, Laura, what we are talking about? Sudan had one of the biggest African cadres, <coughs> highly educated people, shattered. Now they have to start from nothing. Ethiopia. In 27 years, $37 billion stolen by a minority who constitute only 6% of the population, even though this 6% they didn't get, that capital left the country. The new young prime minister, he is in problem. He has to pay only every year for the interest of the loan of the country, only interest, $2 billion. 70% of our country, inhabitants, are less than 30%. 30, they, they are less than 30 years. More than 20 million, they are lumpen proletariat. To bring peace, we have to find job for these people. 
they want to marry, they want to live their own life, and so on and so on. To conclude, peace is not an easy job to bring. It's a very, very complicated and difficult job. I appeal to peace-loving people and peace movements. First, to listen to our appeal. Support us with their experience. We want to teach the youth the value of peace, even though they know young people are dying on the sea, traveling via Libya, became victim of human traffickers, and so on and so on. One element I will tell you, and then why peace again is responsible. There is now resources competition in the world. 60% of the world's resources is in the African continent. It's a curse it became for the African people. Normally, if you have 60% of world wealth, then you should live like Austria, Switzerland. People should, in fact, they should million Africans should come and visit Vienna. The contrary, it's not like that. With the technology, with the new technology, New resources are every single day is discovered in Africa. Water, all type of resources. <clears throat> Not only peace lovers, but those who are concerned for environment. They should be concerned now. The bonanza for looting Africa resources, it will bring war. AFRICOM is in Africa. This is the new NATO forces led by United States and French. The Chinese have built their military base in Djibouti. That is a competition. I think this transformation of new economic forces in Asia, it will not be smooth. And I hope it will not repeat twice as it repeated in Europe. European people know what does it work twice. And it cost them a huge human resources killed and destroyed. Conclusion, we have to broaden the concept of peace. Not to think peace is equal as two savages are fighting. That's a colonial, a new colonial concept. Unacceptable. We are not savages. And it's not our willing to go and fight. All the wars you see in that continent, it is not our war. It is engineered war. Behind our back. And we have no control about it. <coughs> the only control we have, to raise the consciousness of the youth that it cannot be dangerous to itself. And this, we have to develop jointly. And I appeal to all of you, all those people who are involved in peace, if you can help us, we have no other fund. Maybe we'll have a, a meeting places. We can even 
cook for you food, traditional food. Our, our sisters and our mothers will cook for you. Very delicious, you, can, you will enjoy it. <coughs> Little bit spicy will re reduce the spice for you. But we have no the means. Neither the capital or the petty cash. But I invite you, if we can make a conference together in the heart of Africa, in the heart of African Union, you are welcome. African Union, it's a cat without a teeth. It doesn't bite. It has no any meaning. It dances for anybody who have money. If you can build people to people peace within the country, people to people within the Horn of Africa, people to people within the continent, Africa, Europe, people to people, Australians, I will conclude, they know what does it mean, peace. You don't have to go very far. You have to read Austrian history. Austro-Hungarian history will provide you the concept of peace. And thank you. If you have any other question, I really wanted to declare in the old city, Vena, I'm a historian. It will be, my country is exactly as an empire as the Habsburg. There is no difference. And the way it was created also is the same. It have a lot of nationalities. Austria had German speaking, Hungarians, the Slavic, Slovenians, Croat, Czech, Slovak. That is Ethiopia. Somali, Amhara, Tigre, Oromo, 80. We don't want that Ethiopia to end up like the Habsburg Empire. We believe through peace we can forge a new Ethiopia and a new Horn of Africa. And I thank you very much. If you have any other question you can ask me, uh, we can discuss openly with your experience. Uh, we need your support. We learn from each other. And thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Professor Hassan. Uh, maybe uh, you want to? Uh, OK, später was sagen. Okay. You said that the Austrian Empire had so many nationalities, <coughs> which is true. But what followed? They all separated into separate countries, you know? That is true. I don't mm. want that divorce to happen. Right. It is a very difficult thing. It is three empires collapsed. It's not only the Austrian Empire, the Ottoman Empire also. When you read deep, and I, I, when you, I will send you to him my book, uh, The Strategy de Kao, Imperialism and Islam. When I was teaching, young people start asking me a lot of questions. So finally, one day I decided with my, my friends, I said, what is your questions? Can you write me? So we launched it in the internet. What did you know about Egypt? <clears throat> Teachers and students. So they sent a lot of information. I have two friends. One is a journalist, very famous journalist, Michel Colo. Another one is a young journalist. And they collected, and it's about 82,000 Questions came. When we sorted out, it concentrated Egypt, 
what is Libya, what is the Ottoman, what is Iran, because the Shia, whatever it is, and all this news, uh, uh, Islamist, Papa, Sunni, Shia, and all this about Iran and the foundation, not old Persia, modern Iran from the Qajar until now. Syria and so on, so on. So I combined until Eritrea and so on. I answered to them. It is to be for them a sort of syllable. Uh, 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 it's like uh, a tourist guide. You go to Egypt, please read this. You read this, you understand the ordinary people in Egypt and the history of Egypt. You go there, first read. That's why we published it about 10 years ago. So to come to your point, there is a possibility what you are saying could happen in my country. And not to happen, it's a divorce. My theme is no divorce. I start looking and I say, Interesting thing I found of Woody Allen film. Living together apart in the same house. You don't have to live like me, and I don't have to live like you, but we can live in the same home. That is what I'm trying, and I hope we will succeed with your help, with the experience of other countries, with the experience of Yugoslavia, because so promote confidence building among the people. One of the major is that it is the people, they don't know each other. Less transportation, some are Christian, some are Muslims, some are Orthodox, some are Catholic, some are Protestant, and so on, to introduce the youth to think wider. And I think the logo will be Peace in the Horn of Africa. And because I came from one of the most suffered nationality, we said, we understand peace because we suffered for 60 years war and conflict. We couldn't use our resources. We could be a bridge. And uh, you are welcome, you are advised, come to the conference, you can advise. There is a lot of uh, uh, young people who have uh, diplomas in their pocket. For me, schooling and education are two different things. Any idiot can go to school and can have a paper at the end. But educating is something else, totally different, a broader consciousness. And from that perspective, I say, with comrade here, and with your help, we could start a new chapter in history. Thank you. I talk too much. Professor Hassan, two questions, please. Uh, the first one, the conflict between Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan, about the water from the meat from them. Do you think that it will be a war in that case? Yeah. If any agreement achieved uh, could be really a war between the two countries when yes, not one. Second question, you said uh, that the Cold War is over and is changing the world. China is there active in America. There active, yeah? especially in Djibouti, in Sudan, Kenya, in and we are uh, uh, speaking about a new Cold War because the uh, United States is not over. You can't say that with the Trump or without the Trump. Yeah? And the West uh, world is not over, it's not finished. Yeah? It's a new Cold War. And the African countries have to change too. We had to change before, as Tunisia, we have Africa too, we had to change. And I, got, I, I think we have to change in the future between <laughs> China, India, Iran, 
Russland an, USA, EU. I think so. It's in your mm. conflict already. Yeah. Yeah? Yes. Mm. What is your uh, point of view can about you, this? Can you please explain us like the problem with the Nile River? Because we don't know. You know, but we even don't know the conflict. Maybe you can explain us Brilliant. a little. That's correct, yeah. 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 Very good. Uh, the first Nile agreement between Ethiopia and Egypt happened around eight years ago. But is it an agreement between Ethiopia and Egypt? The joke behind it. Egypt, in, until 1952, it was a colony of Great Britain. Hundred ten thousand British soldiers occupied the Swiss Canal, and they are taking all the benefit from the Swiss Canal. Egypt got independent only in 1952, when the officers took power under Nasser. And that is why immediately the Swiss war came. Ethiopia have a lot of rivers. She is not even able to use one river for development. Now, the previous prime minister, to give you how the project came, a man of the 12th century, have a tie and a beautiful suit. I call him Alfonso. When the Portuguese arrived to the African continent in the 16th century, by accident, which now became Angola and Congo, they met a chief, a tribal chief, Abalu. They met him. Said, by that moment, the Portuguese, the whole Europeans, they were very short people, and the Portuguese, they were only one meter and 20. And the African was a giant. <laughs> How they could make these tall Africans, captured by very short people, put them in a boat, <laughs> and bring them? to Brazil and so, and so on. You have to calculate, you have to. It's not what they told us, but you have to study history properly. They went to this man, a chief. A chief who have a war and conflict with his neighboring chief. They brought for him alcohol. He didn't know alcohol. And a mirror. The man, he was surprised, he said, I can see myself. He have never seen himself because he didn't have a mirror. They said, we want people. He invaded his neighbor. He, pick, he captured the young people and he gave to the Portuguese. After a while, the production increased. The Portuguese liked him. They say, you are invited to Lisbon. They took him by boat. They brought him to Lisbon. They baptized him to Christianity, Catholic. And then they crowned him. And they call him King Alfonso. The new kings of their agents they have put in there. One is the Tunisian he's overthrown. The other one is the prime minister, which I work with. And we have been in the same school, in the secondary school. We knew each other. We used to play football. You give him a book today about Buddhism, 
he will read the whole night about Buddhism and he will be a Buddhist. Then the next morning he comes to him and he gives him about Hinduism. He will read everything about Hinduism. He will condemn Buddhism and he will become a Hindu. A man of a shallow reader sitting in a big country prime minister. He went to Egypt in 1993. He met the vice president of Egypt, Suleiman, and he said, I want to talk to you about the Nile. The Egyptian was very arrogant. He was vice president. He insulted him. He came back and said, I will show them. The project started from this anger. It's not from a wisdom of building for it will be electricity or something. The man insulted me. I will show him. I will build a dam. Simple. So simple. He came and he, he took, he put his hand in our pocket. He took our salaries <laughs> and so on. National hero and so and so on. This is the weakness of Africans. To compare it as an information to give you further, Mobutu Seseko, after independence, he asked the World Bank three billion and a half dollars to build one of the, the biggest dam in African history, the Inca Dam in River Congo, the fastest river in the world. The estimation of the World Bank, they say, this river, the electricity it gives, it will give for one, one sixth of the world. When the project is finished and they give him the key, never worked one day, it was closed, please go and visit Congo and see this dam. Never worked. Why? 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 That was not the purpose. The purpose, the purpose is kickbacks. It's not the purpose to give. The villages around the dam, they never had, until today, they never had electricity. So we have to stop the joke. The media, the Arab media, you know, this uh, 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 crazy Arabs with the turban. Al Jazeera, this is, our, it's not a media. A proper disco is better than them. Qatar have problem with Egypt, so she wants to punish Egypt at the expense of us. She comes to uh, bah, 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 bah. Qatar is a very small, as the Arabs say, Tal'ab Akhtar min Hajmaha. If a very big giant man comes to me, I'm a very small man and all, do you think I will fight him? He pitch me one punch, I will fall, or even I will go to coma. Qatar, is it just it is not as big as Vena? And because of they had little bit cash, they intervene everywhere. My understanding is Sudanese, Egyptians, and Ethiopians. In the name of peace, all of us are children of the Nile, first of all. Egyptians are our brothers, Sudanese our brothers and sisters. We can come to agreement, win-win situation. It's possible. This is an international water. Ethiopia cannot alone build a dam and decide. Neither the Sudanese also can decide alone, nor the Egyptian can decide. And for Egyptian, it is their own life. And they are our brothers, we can agree. That's why I say, first, let's be, let's know each other. That's why I said, peace is important. We don't know each other. Other forces, they incite us. And I say, as the Somali proverb say, for somebody is crazy, his families are not crazy. They will treat him good to get recovered and this peace agreements the peace thing we 
One of the things which is, I hope, uh, the gentleman sitting near to me, that when we initiate in Addis Ababa about peace, we will also uh, speak about this. And we will invite Ethiopian experts, Egyptian experts, Sudanese experts, I say, and instead of gossiping behind the people in the rooms, come straight forward. They never tell to their people. They use media. Sisi, he uses this dumb thing as a PR. He have another problem. Huh? Very big problem he have in the country. He says, look only to the Nile. The Ethiopians are stopping. The Ethiopian side, they say, don't discuss about other sick, look to the Nile. Egyptians are stopping. As if they have called each other and they say, this is our trick, a new voodoo. We can keep these Negroes together and let them dance there. But me and you, we have to stay in power. We can break that together. There is no, there are, it's, not, it, it's possible to come to agreement with all of us. The other is about Chinese. If I have a gold shop in Vena, in the center, I have gold, diamond, and everything. I have no alarm, I open the door and go to another cafe to drink coffee, coffee, uh, coffee. I uh, make it open. You don't think a thief will come, will take whatever he wants? This I'm inviting the thief, it is open, come in, at further, with a, take. The Chinese, they come with a cash. They come bribe you, First of all, here uh, as uh, information, there is two sorts, two sorts of Chinese capital. One is the capital direct coming from the People's Republic and from the government's investor of China, from the People's Republic of China. The second is the overseas Chinese. I don't know how, how you are versed on China. I'm a specialist on China. 55 million Chinese, this is long history, Southern Chinese. The Southern Chinese are four tribes. One of them is the tribe of Deng Xiaoping. Confucianism was in the North, the Northerns who built the Chinese state and history, but the Southerns were considered vagabonds because under the philosophy of Confucian, trade, a trader is a liar. He buys cheap and he sells dear. So he must lie, he's a tricky man. So considered by the North Confucian, they are liars, cheaters, low civilization, and so on. A lot of them migrated, true. They were also pirates, they came. 55 million of them, they live in Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Macau, the Philippines, Madame Aquino, she's a Chinese, overseas Chinese, Thailand, even in Vietnam, but the, Viet the Vietnamese kicked them out later on with the contradiction they had with China. Their number, is 55 million. They dominate the economy of these countries. They have a capital of 2 trillion euro, as equal as the GDP of Germany. They have 55 million. Now, with openness of China, one of the objectives of Deng Xiaoping, when he say, I don't care, whether the cat is black or green or yellow, as long as it catches the mouse, he means I will open the market. So he's appealing to this rich Chinese. You know, everywhere there's Chinese town they have, they are in, illegal, involved in drug, and in, in a lot of things, these people, they have a lot of money. And they dominate these countries. These countries are smart, these people. What they did is that, China allowed them, because it allowed them citizenship even. So they went and they opened 
banks and offices in Shanghai, and so on in China. These tricky Chinese who want things easily with quick fix, they are the ones who also come to Africa. The Africans, they cannot differentiate between this overseas Chinese and the other Chinese. African states, they have to specialize on China. Who is who? Who is coming to us? Today, there are three million Afri Chinese are settled. One million and a half of them are settled in Mozambique. They even took land and so and so on, and it will increase. I don't blame the Chinese. I blame the Africans themselves. If you don't know with whom you are dealing, then it is your problem. And you leave your door shop open. Open, yes. <coughs> Anybody can take from you. So we have, we, we have to train our, not for hate, we can deal with the Chinese. There is no people. I had been a diplomat of Ethiopia in the People's Republic of China in the 90s. There is no people who suffered as Chinese. The Chinese from 1840, or the Opium War, until 1949, 100 million Chinese died. So these Africans, they have to respect themselves and do the job. They are lazy and they are agent of other forces. So you, you young man like you, study, know these people, don't complain. Chinese suffered and they did their homework. And I say chapeau for them. The Africans, they need a good leadership. And that good leadership comes only, also the Arabs, they are very lousy. Only it comes from inside. Therefore, I don't blame Chinese. I blame myself. If I open my home, why, why China? Yesterday was a, a French and a, and a British is robbing you, and today is a Chinese. What is the difference? So it is our mistake. Uh, uh, we, have, we have to, and that's why I say the slogan of peace. We want peace in every sense of it. We want peace also with the thief. Please, when you come to us, we are peaceful, but we know you want to steal us. Please don't start your trick with us because we are training our people. <laughs> uh, instead of getting angry and so on, we have to prepare our people, our youth, and so, and so on. And I decided I'm, I'm going in Ethiopia every time. I lectured in the television, and so, there are people who doesn't like me. Some of them, young people who made it money with China, construction builders and this and this and that. And they come to me and they said, oh, we don't, you are, you are killing the dynamic. I said, which dynamic? Your pockets dynamic or uh, uh, the majority's people dynamic? Yeah. That is the difference. 